Give us any chance, we'll take it. Read us any rule, we'll break it. We're gonna make our dreams come true. Hi, everyone. So we typically have a tendency of recording these episodes quite early before we end up putting them live. And uh, the episode that's coming up today was recorded in June of 2020. But we're recording this now, uh, this little intro on December 8th, 2020, which means unfortunately, we do have to talk about the passing of time and the passing of legends. And so today we wanted to give a little memorial uh, discussion of um, David L. Lander, the wonderful actor who played Andrew Squiggy Squigmon. And um, yeah, we've got some things to say just, you know, to honor him and thank him and all that sort of stuff. And uh, Lisa, I guess I guess that's your that's your cue. David was such a talented man. He was so good in this part in that he could like almost seemingly effortlessly embody this character and bring him to life and make him breathe in a way that um, it's very hard to do. But with him, he just, you know, you, if you watch an episode of this show, if you watch, like, one of the Shots Talent Show episodes, or Duke of Squigman, or um, even Driving Test, and you sit there and you watch him, it's just amazing because there's not a single ounce of anything but Squiggy on that screen. That's how good of an actor he was. I feel like he was highly underrated as an actor. Highly underrated. He did a lot of interesting things that weren't Squiggy, that, um, you know, had not been sung to the proper volume, let me put it that way. Yeah, I think that's 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 a good way of putting it. You know, he had this long career. I mean, basically... Yeah. Because, I mean, God, the guy was working for... Basically, he was working in show business for about 50 years. Yeah. If I'm if I if I'm correct, because yeah. if this 1970 was when he started getting his first like writing gigs. Yeah. And, you know, and and all of these different pieces. Now, I unfortunately am not amazingly familiar with his uh, with his work, but his uh, outside outside of um, Laverne and Shirley. But yeah. he, you know, it, it's the type of person that now that I've begun to examine more of the work he's done. um, there's just so much that he was able to give, not just to the squeaky character, but to all of his performances. There was something very distinctive that, you know, and even realizing he was in, he was like voice acting, you know, yeah. in projects that I didn't even realize he was there. Like he's in yeah. Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I yes, only found that out. You just found that out through this? I didn't know. Yeah. My generation probably, if they don't remember him as Squiggy, they remember him as Smartass, the weasel from Who <laughs> Framed Roger Rabbit. That's who they remember him as. Uh, he did a lot of important VA work generation after my generation probably remembers him from Oswald, where he was Henry the Penguin for seasons. Um, he did a lot of good VA work, a lot of voices that would surprise you, you wouldn't think of right off the top of your head. Uh, people uh, even further down the generational line, they're probably going to remember the fact that he played Squiggy on The Simpsons. Not himself, Squiggy. Yes. Literally the fictional character is Squiggy in the episode Helter Shelter, which is a really, really interesting experience. If you sit there and watch the episode, it's like, it, the episode itself kind of feels like it comes from Mars in a way. And that's just almost like it, it, it fits. In the end, it fits, you know. It fits this general of the squiggy character so that's what probably each generation will remember him best as yeah. doing and i mean and i and it's another yeah like another one i'm i was looking back up through the list another one that i did see as a as a kid was him on hey arnold as sam yes. the sewer king i yes. vague i probably haven't watched that episode since it aired in 96 but uh -huh. it's uh but i remember i remember the sewer king yeah. I do. I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't. Rem I don't remember the uh, the details of the episode though. But yeah, it's just. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's so. It, it doesn't matter whether he was playing like a kind of quick, you know, voice acting role like for one episode, or if he was a regular on something. And he actually did a lot of regular gigs. I mean, he was yes. uh, a regular on the Garfield animated series. Yes, he played. Um, he played Doc, didn't he? He played Doc. Mm -hmm. He played John's brother. And he was in, the first time he played his brother was in A Garfield Christmas. And then he went on to reprise the role uh, in the Zero's uh, Garfield uh, 
animated show that was on Nickelodeon. And and yeah, it's it's a it's it's definitely I I just love and I I guess one of the things I love is that when you discuss you know now becoming familiar with them through the show and looking at these parts because um you know we've watched a couple of these projects and we've yeah. you know since his since his passing we've we've seen lots of clips go out yeah. um I I mean personally my favorite is the clip of the uh, the was it the bootmaker clip from uh, on the air which is a yeah. Mark Frost David Lynch sitcom yeah quote unquote yes that lasted the season and is amazing. Yes. And yeah, I, I need to track down that show. That is incredible. And, and it's, it's cause it's, it's so my description of it is it's like, it's the most stunningly goofy, weird on brand for squeaky performance. Basically. Yes. That's perfect. Uh, David was obviously in twin peaks. Mm -hmm. He played taxidermist for anybody who doesn't know that he had a specific, a, if we're talking his horror work, he had a really memorable episode of Freddy's Nightmares. In which he played a character named Lenny, believe it or not. And uh, the episode is Lucky Stiffs, and it's really good. That's if we're gonna talk his horror work, that's pretty creme de la creme. Man, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah. And it's it's kind of sad, you know. The, these things happen where, you know, I guess it's a reminder to that if you like a performance, to really continue seeking out the performances from that actor, especially if you really enjoy their work. Yeah. Because that type of support is nice. It creates a connection. Yeah. And, you know, for us, you know, that's something that, you know, obviously with this show and with other things that we've been into, you know, we've felt very passionately about. We're nerds for this stuff. You yeah. Know, we, we want we want to make media. We love telling stories. We we live for this. And, um, and yeah, so it's it's a, you know, it, I thought it was really wonderful, the, the quote, the, the thing that um, Michael yeah. posted. Yeah. Um, regarding it saying that you know he basically i thought it was nice to not see this sort of distancing yeah where it's that david meant you know he meant something very special to the people who knew him from yes. all the things that we've been seeing coming out both from yes. the furniture of the cast and from anyone else who worked with him yes um and from his daughter and from his widow mm -hmm. beautiful things but it's like we had but I, I guess I like the acknowledgement, which I which just reminded me to acknowledge we have as an audience a relationship with creators. Yeah. Of, you know, performances, of stories, of film, of art. Yeah. For those who haven't seen Michael's tweet, he said that if he made you laugh, then he was your friend too. Which is beautiful. Yeah. As always, he knows how to put it. He always yeah. knows how to put it. I don't know how he does it, but he always knows how to put it. Yeah. So um Aside from the other ones that we've mentioned, are there, are there any other recommendations you'd like to put out there? Okay. If you're going to look up the huge phalanx of uh, cameos that David did, like in the 90s or the zeros, you have to watch the episode of The Nanny he guest starred in, where he basically plays Squiggy, who is in a relationship with, his, with Leonard for like over 10 years. They live upstairs in an apartment that looks like uh, the Laverne Shirley uh, basement apartments. And uh, he's Val and uh, Fran's landlord. And why he just sinks his teeth into that has always amused me. It's terrific. I just love that particular cameo. Uh, if you want to do a quick crash course in episodes when it comes to squiggy centric stuff you gotta start with duke of squigman which gives you a lot of psychological insight into the character and it's really beautifully acted uh squiggy in love david gets a lot of meat here and he just you know pops character life driving this is the first time squiggy shows anything remotely close to vulnerability and it's a really 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 good episode Helmet Weekend, in Season 7, we finally meet Squiggy's dad, and he just knocks it out of the park when it comes to acting out the wounded rage of this like half-grown man who's still a boy in his soul. Uh, and if you're going to go for total AU episodes, where it almost doesn't, uh, you know, you get to different sides of what both David and Michael can do, or could do in David's case. Uh, Perfidy in Blue is a soap opera parody in season seven where Squiggy plays a rich scion 
and he's having an affair with a character played by Penny, who's supposed to be Laverne in disguise, and uh, is married to Shirley. And it's really, really fun. Everybody just chews that kind of scenery and it's terrific. He does a lot of great, funny physical stuff in that. Also, Born Too Late, which is a really fun episode in which uh, it's just entirely about Lenny and Squiggy fantasizing about what life would be like if they were starring in silent movies. And the pastiches are so dead on, and their acting is terrific, so that's a pretty good starter kit for anyone who just wants to dip the toes and see what did he do on the show that's so iconic and memorable. So. It's a good list. I mean, I've, I'm only familiar really with uh, Driving Test, but that's yeah. uh, well, that's really good stuff. So that's interesting. We saw Squiggy in Love. To... We we saw Squeak oh yeah and sorry love. excuse me Squeak and love yeah and I lo- yeah and and that was also that agreed that was a fan both those were fantastic driving test I especially loved because it was what's great about it is how David knows exactly what he's doing to play this character with a particular way that kind of his brain works yeah and which is you know having acted before that's a much harder thing to yeah. to perform than one would think yeah. you know because there's there's so many components at work and you're basically having to like separate from yourself, which is one of the amazing things I think about David and one of the unfortunate things that kind of happens in a way with uh, his um, being so good at that role is I would not be surprised if some of the gigs that he was offered or some of the gigs that he took ended up being cases where he was kind of pigeonholed into this certain part because, um, because I, to be honest, I mean, there's, there's an incredible talent and I think it's great that he did have the the body of work that he did just because, you know, just over time he was going to able to create other roles that are not squeaky, yeah. but he, he was, vi- you know, I guess what it means is it shows, you know, I guess speaking as a director myself, I guess what I'm getting at is I wish I had like been able to make films with him during his heyday in like the seventies and the eighties yeah. where I could take this actor that has all of these possibilities and potential and see what else we can do with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like one of those, Oh, I wish I could go in there and, give more, put more in, put more into the pot, so to speak. When, post-show, like, David was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis about a year after the show wrapped. Uh, it was, like, all, he had very, very little time between the show wrapping and then having his illness, and then he and his wife jointly decided to hide it from the public because they were afraid it was going to impact his uh, acting career. And they hit it until uh, the 90s. Uh, I don't know how much of what he chose to do, you know, he was trying to avoid being squiggy. He did those rules and it proved he didn't have to be squiggy all the time. There's a lot of fun stuff. Like, he did a part on Married with Children where he uh, plays a uh, high school acquaintance of Al Bundy and Peg Bundy. That is really, that's another good example of how he could be, be anybody but Squiggy. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he had a few roles where he just, that stick out and shine. And prove that he had that depth. To get what I'm saying. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I was just curious, uh, when are we going to mention Funland? I was just going to mention Funland. We actually watched Funland together uh, about two weeks, three weeks, no, about three weeks before David's passing. And he is so good in that movie as this poor, tormented dude who, you know, basically becomes his role as a clown. He becomes an assassin clown. A murderous, sharpshooting assassin clown. So, I mean, to be the, to be fair, the the movie lets him down because he does this amazing performance, yeah. and the movie can't quite make up its mind how far yeah. it wants to go, yeah. which is my biggest frustration with it. He's yeah. amazing in the film, and actually, yeah. the way that some of the actors interact with him is wonderfully tender. You realize at the start of the movie, this character has had that psychological break, and and David sells that with that yeah. wonderful deadpan straight faced, you know, aspect and watching his performance as it develops. And he has, you know, these conversations with like fictional characters from yeah. the, I think it's the wax statues, right? It's yes. the wax museum statues. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. The way he plays that God. Wow. It's so great. It's so great. And it's, it's so just, good. it's a bummer that the film can't commit to the sort of vigilante 
justice of the conclusion yeah. that it that it needs yeah. to. Yeah. The problem with the movie is that it can't really decide if it wants to be a black comedy or an action movie or an exploitation film. That's the problem with that movie. Yeah. If it had decided on a tone and committed to that tone, then it would have been a much stronger film. Yeah. Uh, it it in some ways it feels like a great on Clark or a um uh yeah the other two uh, Al Adamson it's like yeah. Al Adamson or Great on Clark yeah but whereas those two directors usually know exactly the movie that they're making yeah it's like everybody's making a different kind of movie exactly and all you need is just one single solitary molecule of solid direction in one mo one mood or another mood. It needs a solidified mood. Exactly. Is what I would have to say. Because there are chunks of it that are so perfectly atmospheric. Mm-hmm. That are so good. And it, all it needs is just a little bit more. Just tighten the bolts. Tighten the bolts. Screw in the screws. Cut a little subplot here. Cut a yeah. subplot there. Because that's the thing is, yeah. the subplots distract from David's presence. Because David's exactly. so good in the film. And then it's like you're focused on characters that never interact with him elsewhere in the movie. It's like, yeah. why are we, yeah. why are we, why, you know, because, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. he plays a character named Bruce Berger, who is, uh, who was formerly this accounting guy that was very smart, you know, with business and investment. And... You know, like, and I love those little touches about how, like, oh, well, Neil, you know, was telling me about this thing, but, you know, what does Neil know? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's actually part of his past self. And David plays that with such perfect yeah. integration. And the way it ends was his, he nails that kind of Norman Bates finale so yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. 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 God, yeah. Yeah. He as did. of as of this recording yeah. in December, it is, uh, it is still on Prime. It's pretty much a VHS rip, but yeah. it's, uh. It's it's one of those like you know if you want to watch you know get to see David Lander do kind of more of a it's sort of what I'm saying like this performance where you see like oh man there is so much potential for this actor here yeah um that's a definite good one to check out yeah 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 that's probably my favorite when it comes to uh, the B movies he did uh, I know there were several that you wanted to check out when uh, we looked at his IMDb you went oh I want to see that I think there was like a couple. Uh, but that's the one that sticks out to me the most. Yeah, the other two I was looking looking at was uh, Steel and Lace, um, and then uh, Steel Justice. I think his part's pretty small, but I'll yeah. take a look at that. The big one I really want to see out of the B movie work he did was he was the English voice for a French uh, adult kind of adult comedy called uh, The Big Bang. It's an animated um, kind of sex farce, <laughs> and he. And he plays the lead voice, uh, Fred Hero. Um, the synopsis goes, it's a sex farce about Fred, an inept post-World War III superhero garbage man who must prevent World War IV by disarming the continents of Virginia, where mutated feminists live, and the USSR, where mutated buttless men live. Beautiful Liberty is his only ally. Oh my god, that sounds wild. That sounds wild. Oh my god. Oh my lord, that sounds amazing. I didn't even know yeah, if that existed. Oh my lord! Yeah, again, this is one of those. Neither did I. And uh, and uh, similar. I think I'm about to find an interesting connection. It looks like the uh, yes, it appears that the dub was uh, one of the writers of the dub uh, the dub track. You know, to help translate it is Tony Hendra, aka Ian Faith from Spinal Tap. Oh wow! Okay, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. That is awesome. Because I didn't know. So again, in the case of you know, just uh, these are these are definitely much more intense films that we're mentioning than uh, Laverne and Shirley. So yeah. you know, be be wary. Maybe look up some content warnings yeah. if you need them. Please look up content warnings before you check out any of these. Any of them. <laughs> uh, oh lord! If you haven't heard. Uh, the Lenny and the Squid Tones live album, listen to that. Listen to that. If you're going to listen to just one thing in tribute to David's memory, listen to that. Because it is so good. And he's so good on it. And uh, he and Michael wrote some amazingly catchy songs that fit within the Milo of these characters. And they're clearly having the time of their life on stage recording that album. So that's mm -hmm. my one additional recommendation. 
And do you have a favorite song from that album? Uh, that would be If Only I Have Listened to Mama. Sooner or later. <laughs> the one that still gets me is The, the Creature Without a Head. Without a Head. Yep, I knew you love that one. I love you love that one. I had Night After Night stuck in my head uh, all day yesterday, and I don't know why. But it was just stuck in my head all day. And it was the version from the live uh, recording. Who wants to sleep with the same broad line after night? <laughs> so, oh my gosh. That was stuck in my brain. But yeah, that's an incredible album. We still wait for it to be released in the official format, too. It still hasn't been released in the official yeah. format anywhere. You have to pay for a vinyl and then you have to compete with Spinal Top fans because Christopher Guest is on it, too. So you have to, mm -hmm. like, arm wrestle them for your own copy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'd be remiss not to mention how much David loved baseball. Uh, mm. Fans probably recognize the fact that he loved it from his little cameo in Penny's League of Their Own, uh, where he played a baseball announcer. Uh, David scouted for both uh, the Angels and the Mariners. Uh, he was a huge uh, Pirates fan, Pittsburgh Pirates. You can actually see him wearing a pirate hat during Lenny's crush in the stands where Squiggy and uh, Shirley are rooting for and against the Milwaukee Braves. And that was a nod to his huge fandom for the Pirates. And uh, he apparently didn't like the Yankees, according to MLB.com, which I looked up to double-check all my facts with. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, relatable, dude, understandable. He actually owned, uh, the, uh, had a partial ownership stake in the Portland Beavers, which is a minor league team, uh, in the 80s, which is interesting, I think. That's how much he loves baseball. And that, that's true love. And if you like sports ball, tell us what the record was like. Because I don't know. Sadly, I don't. But I want, I wish I did. I wish yeah, I you did. you know, I mean, did, did, did uh... I would love to. I, that's. A, I guess that's a question I would love to 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 have answered. Is like you know his uh, scouting efforts. Did that lead to anything special within the uh, within the world? You know, of, yeah. of baseball. Like did did he track anything down? Was he able to make? You know, was he able to you know bring certain people forward to the forefront? You know, I just kind of kind of know. It's I'm kind of, now I'm curious. Yeah, honestly, I am. I am too. I am too. But uh, in any case, though, I guess to, to wrap things up, we this, this is a much longer tribute than I expected for us to give to, uh, to anybody on the show. But, you know, oh, David deserves it, but he deserves it. I mean, yeah. the more I think about it, the more looking at his credits and how incredibly important he was to the show, the episodes yeah. that he co-wrote, the performance that he gave, the um, this, the infamous story of him drop kicking a script into the into the, <laughs> into the roof of the, of the soundstage. Um, I love that story. Yeah, for I mean, you know, it's a case of you know, I I had a feeling I was never gonna get, get to meet any of the cast of the show, but this is one that like when I think about it, it's like, man, I wish I could have, because this sounds this is a creative guy, a fun guy, and a good man, and it sounds like, uh, you know, heaven's gonna have a lot more laughs right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I should have mentioned yes. Watch High Neighbor. Watch High Neighbor book two, because that is the boys distilled to their essences underneath Michael and David's own pants. So, if you ever want to understand how they became such a huge phenomenon, you'll understand if you watch those two episodes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so I guess, um, is, is that all for, uh, for this edition? I think that might be it. Yeah. Rest in peace, David Lander. Um, you made us so happy as an audience as viewers you still bring people to this show that squiggy still packs them in and it's been so many years later and the show is still kicking in its own way and there's no better tribute i can pay to him than that i think yeah I think you pretty much, I think you covered it the best there. I think the only thing I guess I can say at the last is, you know, thanks, Squig, and uh, best of luck on the rest of your rest of your journey. Yeah. 
Uh, so with that, I guess we'll get back into the episode. So just as a reminder that, you know, we've uh, done this nice long uh, tributary introduction. Um, this actually is about the length of the episode that is about to come now. Um, yeah. But uh, so just a reminder, you know, we'll be to this week's episode. And without further ado, we'll uh, I guess we'll, we'll sign off on this tributary edition to this episode. And with that, we will move into our coverage of the episode Call Me a Taxi from the second season of Laverne and Shirley. Welcome to Night After Night, a podcast about eight seasons in a row. I am Lisa Fernandes, and... I am Chris Jai Wardena. Hello. And we're here to review Call Me a Taxi, which is an episode from the second season of Laverne and Shirley, uh, directed by Alan Myerson, written by Deborah Lustin, and Paul A. Roth. And you probably have some info with two of them, and the whole lot of them. Uh, yeah, 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 it's all, it's all three. We, we got those for all oh, three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Alan Myerson finally returns. He's been kind of gone for a little bit, but he was... Uh, he was around a lot for season one, and it's uh, good to see him return. This is his second episode of the second season of Laverne and Shirley. But Myerson was basically sitcom television comedy legend. I mean, this guy worked on Bob Newhart. He worked on Tony Randall. Um, he also did, as we've discussed prior, uh, he also did the movie Private Lessons, which, oh boy, we'll, we'll move on. Oh, um, but through the 80s, he also did a bit of an extreme mixture of... Um, Things such as uh, he actually did the infamous Bad Moon's Rising Picket Fences episode, which uh, that's the famous Lauren Holly one. Um, And uh, he also in the 80s did a couple episodes of Miami Vice, an episode of Crime Story. So he worked with Michael Mann for a little bit. And uh, more recently, you know, he's done stuff. I did a little Gilmore Girls 20 years ago. He's uh, and also about 15 years ago, he worked on Judging Amy for seven years. Oh. Uh, seven, sorry, seven years, seven episodes. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so that's Alan. And Alan, you know, is, is clearly one of the best of the Laverne and Shirley directors that we've seen so far. Yeah. And, and we, have, we have we have a good handful left from, from oh, him yeah. before his his tenure is done. Yeah. Uh, a as, bunch. Yeah. As to the writers, uh, we have uh, Deborah Lation, who worked on Fake Out the Stake Out, as well as was the co-writer for Look Before You Leap, which is, uh, I, I think around these parts, is considered, uh, how you say, a good episode. A very good and, episode. And uh, this is uh, one of mo- many more that she has. Uh, she's, she's got about four or five more, which actually is, you know, for TV writing, that's actually quite a bit. Uh, she also worked a bit as a scripts consultant on Rhoda during the, around the same time. And... Um, that's pretty cool. She also was, um, as I think we mentioned in the Look Before You Leap episode, but uh, she ended up marrying her uh, co-writer for uh, that episode. Uh, Mr. Looking up the name. I used to have it now for some reason. I don't got it. Or brain. Declan. David Declan, who also worked yes, on this season as David, well. Yes, David. Yes. Yes. And uh, any hoot. Uh, then Paula A. Roth also worked on, uh, you know, quite a bit on Laverne and Shirley, as well as a script yes. cons- a story consultant for Happy Days for about three years during the 80s. Worked a little bit on The Love Boat. And uh, yeah, and this we're going to be, let's see. So she worked on the anniversary show and we have, uh, wow, gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more from Paula Roth uh, as the series goes on. So that's kind of our... So nice extend a little intro about the people behind the episode. And I really appreciated it. Here's what the episode's about. When the girls are temporarily laid off from the brewery and with the boys making football crops of cash, the girls become taxi dancers. The semi-tawdry but somewhat lucrative jobs put them in contact with a lot of roughies and a lot of strangers. But what will the girls do when Frank finds out? What do you think of this one? Hmm. It's one I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around a little bit. Um, I will say, I hate to say it, I never, I didn't know what a taxi dancer was until I watched Stanley Kubrick's Killer's Kiss, and that was only like four months ago, I think. So I think that was part of it was like, I wasn't able to like process the concept of it for some reason. I, I don't know. It, it was it was strange for me. I, I don't know. I'll well, As we go through it, I think it'll be a little easier. Um, but it is, that said... It's a delightfully funny episode. The dance uh, stuff is wonderful physical comedy. There are there's at least one amazing guest character. Uh, yes. The the that uh, we'll be we'll be getting to. Um, and it was interesting that the, this is this almost an edgier episode in a way thematically. I think them losing having being laid off created an instability. That's yeah. it's kind of it's, it's it's kind of scary actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then they have to deal with all these creepy dudes. All right. these incredibly creepy dudes who might stab them or might do something horrible to them. Uh, they're specifically warned by the den mother of the place, so to speak, uh, not to go near guys with suitcases. And not to go near guys yeah. with mirrors on their shoes for reasons that are obvious. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way the girls decide to, you know, stay in the game and get what they want is, well, it shows their grit and it shows their absolute uh, fearlessness in a lot of ways. Like, mm -hmm. when they realize that they're not putting out enough sex, so to speak, to track these dudes in, Laverne just rips her dress and gives more cleavage and just goes, dollar dance, dollar dance, and she gets a bunch of, she gets a bunch of guys to get attention that way, and it then surely just stuffs her dress, because of course she does. Yeah. And it's like, so... So, hey, you know, we now realize that it was a bit of a stretch, that it's not that she stuffs socks in her bra, it's tissues. <laughs> I just hope no one has to sneeze. That immoral line, I just hope no one has to sneeze. Right. Yes. Oh, gosh, I love that line. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the Speaking of, by the way, callbacks, I love that line. Like, this is just after guinea pigs, and it's that I'd rather sell my body to science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got you to figure that feels, that feels too yeah. intentional. Yeah, sometimes the episode airing order is all messed up, and things will happen when they already happen, so to speak, like uh, Lenny B already being in the reserves, and oh, episode later he joins them in season one. But uh, I like to think that that was intentional when they schedule these. I like to think it was intentional. Maybe not, but still. Yeah, yeah. Um, I loved that... Um, Carmine knows how to get an abortion. Yes. And a cool, and a toaster and clock radio that are probably hot. So Carmine's versatility, y'all. Yeah. 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 Um I mean it's okay, here's the weird thing. As as we well as been well documented on this show, as on our podcast here, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of of Carmine Ragusa. Somehow, I don't know, maybe it was just that it's just that it's like with the changing times and the fact that I want to get back into, you know, writing noir stories that uh, I, I, I don't know. It was almost kind of it's like, huh, Carmine, I can work with this character now. He's a, he's a, he's a criminal. He's, a, he's, you know, he's got criminal connections. Like now I can like I can, pro you know, project this whole like destiny for him where, you know, he ends up starting as the small time hoodlum and then ends up, you know, in some weird, you know, mixture of a Hong Kong blood opera and a Martin Scorsese movie. And he has to, you know, battle his way through a bunch of goons and shoot up the place to save Shirley. But that's just me. That would be fun. Uh, his underworld connections kind of get more pronounced and discussed as the time will go on. Um, what, by the time we moved to LA, this all gets kind of rinsed out of the wash, so this is uh, pretty much a Milwaukee-only kind of situation for him. Uh, I love that the girls know that we're to go to him to get all these little seedy little things that they need to see. Not call it abortion seedy. I'm talking about the clock radios here. Right, right. <laughs> talking no, about the clock that, radios yeah. and the, and the uh, somewhat... Uh, Tetchy kind of jobs, so to speak. Right. Well, yeah, because just re <laughs> it's a reminder for folks that you know this was pre. God, when was Roe v. Wade? That was in the seventies, right? Way pro v. Way, way, way pre Roe v. Wade. Way. Right. Uh, right. So we're, we're talking that this was yeah, because in nineteen fifty eight to fifty nine, yeah. I mean all that the whole yeah. basically the entire timeline of the Laverne and Shirley show, as far as I know it, um, yeah, yeah. It, uh, this was the, this was the way you were going. Things were going to be done. But yeah. that, but that said, I mean, I will say when I I'm going back over my notes, I think I've I've had time to process this this exchange because my my brain exploded when I got to this, you know, for the first time, and it's <laughs> my notes are in all caps, Carmine fencing stuff, and then an abortion joke. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and um, God. nobody in the universe hates Carmine more than you. And it's just. I mean, me there's, so you know, uh, apparently that's going to be, God, that's going to be a, my, Lisa, don't let that be on my tombstone, please. Hater of Carmine <laughs> Ragusa. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 
but I mean, I do have this point is like, make up your mind. It's like, are you legit or a criminal or what? And also, why are you slimmer? Did he look, did he, did he not look slimmer in this episode for some reason? He probably been lifting. He probably been lifting because Eddie Uh, Mecca was very much more muscular as time goes on in the show. Oh man. And it's noticeable. It's very nicely noticeable sometimes. We promise Carmine folks, well, when he gets, you know, stops the, doing what he does with Shirley throughout these episodes, we'll start liking him more. He becomes yeah. better and more, you know, does yeah. things that make him more sympathetic as time goes on. But there's some really clear syndication screw upery in this episode. You can mm-hmm. tell what was chopped out for syndication, and it is annoying. It is very annoying. Very annoying. Like, uh, there's <laughs> clearly an edit where they had Penny Marshall voice over that her father, that Laverne's father couldn't help them. Therefore, mm. they have to go to Carmine. There is an entire Carmine um, song and dance number that got chopped out. Oh, no. To read into that, yeah. So they didn't want to pay the royalties. So. Jeez. Gosh, yeah. that's that's sad to hear. But, um, yeah, okay. So, because that's the thing, right? We were, we were mentioning how, you know, this is the syndication editor here. And also, for those of us watching the DVDs... Um, this is also where the the restorations kind of start to get hit or miss. Where this yeah. one is just full on like a, it's practically like a VHS rip, yeah. or at the very least, it's it's from the old tapes. And uh, yeah, quality took a hit. I mean, this this file on the DVD is even interlaced. Now, anyone yeah. who understands the tech of it, interlaced versus progressive knows interlaced is disgusting. Yeah. It's gross. It was necessary, yeah. but it's so gross, and I don't like. I don't like it. I don't like it. I ran away from that when I moved to DSLR Cinema and got away from HDV and Mini DV tapes. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Do not like. They stopped paying for restoration just to get these DVDs out. They stopped paying for restoration on the episodes around uh, after season one because they just couldn't get. They didn't have the budget to get these DVDs out. That's why they just started ruthlessly cutting all the musical numbers. Whatever was holding them up, them up. because right. people yeah, kept demanding a- and demanding the show come out, and they stopped for years after they released season one. After and so, people petitioned; and they had to do what they had to do. Yeah, that's what happens. Yeah, and it yeah. sucks. It's it's at the very least, season two overall has had some pretty good. Some are actually pretty well restored. Like I have a feeling oh, yeah. it was in the middle of the season two DVD that they yeah. realized, oh yeah, no, we don't have the money for that. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it's also it's it's a business decision that you have to make about whether you're going to make the sacrifice for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to pick. You had to fish or cut bait when you work sitcoms that way. I mean, Happy Days didn't even get a full DVD release for their later that's, seasons. That's right. Uh, that's right. We're lucky enough to have this whole show on DVD, which is something of a miracle, especially considering how little season eight must have sold. Yeah. Because jeez. Um. But Happy Days is a much longer series, and they had to deal with uh, music cuts, too. I don't know if they have syndication cuts for their released episodes. I think they do. But sometimes the edits are just so obvious, and and some in some episodes, it's just worth paying actual money for the song. It's worth paying for the royalties, mm. because your fans will know, and they'll be able to tell... Uh, they'll see in syndication and go, what? That was an actual musical number? That was an actual song? What? Really? So, just, it's not worth it in the long run. Yeah, it's it's rough. It's brutal. I mean, it's, I mean, you know, as, to bring it back to the episode, I mean, this is even like having, having the girls have to make the decision. Are they going to go work for Rosie Greenbaum and Simonize the, one of the cars? Or are they going to, you know, try to, to get a lead, you know? Carmen makes a call. Yeah. I'm sure he will. And, um, you know, just what can they do, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, they already bandaged the finger. It's not that they can sell blood. Yeah. <laughs> because there, there's not much. <laughs> there's, they, they ultimately, like, yeah, there's not much they can do. So there's not much they could uh, sell in a way. They could sell everything in the apartment. It probably wouldn't even yeah, give them much money. So. Right. Yeah, that's the end of the yeah. Um, I love that we get one of our regular bit players here who ended up with a major part in the season one episode. The fellow who played Eric in uh, How Do You Say Are You Dead in German shows up as one of the guys dancing with the girls. 
Yep, so, and so, still, it still can't speak of the English. Yeah, this time he's what? Uh, it's supposed to be Italian, I think. Yeah, yeah the they actually doing... they actually refer to them as Guidos, which uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say that is a not not a cool term to use. Yeah. I think they yeah, I think they, get, they kind of go away with it because of uh, the Marshall clan being Italian there, and them not asking the question. You know, not just, you're asking yeah. if that was a good idea or not. But, right. Yeah. It's a it's a yeah. it's it's like it's a derogatory term that. It's it's not as bad as others. There's other slurs, but that you know that are yeah. really slurs. It's just a, yeah. you know, yeah. it ain't cool. I guess is what yeah, I mean. Cool. Yo, yeah. it ain't cool is the font to say. It ain't cool. It ain't right. No. It ain't cool. It ain't right. No. Yeah. You gotta have taste in class. You gotta have class. Um, I love also that ultimately Frank is the one who rises the girls' rescue. Yes. He's the one who comes in and realizes, wow, you guys went to these deep, horrible straits. I'm going to kind of pull you up. Mm-hmm. Make sure nothing horrible happens to you. No, it was sweet. There was a lot of little sweet little moments there. Yeah, it's 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 very cute. And it's the, yeah. um, uh, there's something, you know, and I love that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't think of it. I mean, it's, it's a... It's a good burn about how low the, low the minimum wage is that he's yeah. actually like saying it's like, yeah, minimum wage was the difference, you know, yeah. gives them both a job, you know, just yeah. drop of a hat, you know. Yeah, drop of a hat. His, da- his but, daughter's safety at this point is more important. And oh, certainly. Sure he's basically his daughter, yeah. So it's like, yeah. ah, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. I loved when the uh, dead mother kind of approaches him and, Tries to get him to pay her for a dance. He's like, no, look for my daughter. You want to dance with your own daughter? You want to pay to dance with your own daughter? <laughs> so the way she delivers that line is good. There's a lot of great line deliveries in this episode. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, This the, yeah. Meyerson's so good with the dialogue. Yeah. The dialogue's great, but the deliveries. The deliveries make this episode. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely make yeah. it. Um. We're not, we haven't mentioned the Lenny and Squeaky portion of this episode, which is fabulous. Which is amazing. Is. Yeah. Yes. The, the, there's the bit in the beginning and then the payoff to what they do. So, yeah, because because yeah. basically the the whole premise of them getting laid off. And it's, again, you know, we were, we've, we've talked about this before. The feminine, the, the, the progressive feminist angle that, you know, the show yeah. would sometimes take. The girls get laid off. The boys get a raise, yeah. which is and for doing a, a bad job, no yeah. less. Yeah. I mean, that was. Job. And then apparently crashing the truck into something again, right? And they and they get more money, so. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, there there's a great line from Squiggy about that. The girls go, "That's not fair," and he goes, "That's the American way." Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh man, that's biting. That's perfect. biting. Is I love how it's the line that you have to. You're talking about the delivery that has to be delivered with just the right amount of of straightness yeah. that you're taking the line seriously yes yeah. yeah and david david nails everything david even when he's in the background of a scene just nails everything in the wall nails he's just he's just squiggy he's always squiggy he's always in character he's always there projecting this character and his aura and his personality it's good it's just like effortless and i don't know if it was effortless i shouldn't say it was effortless but it he makes, makes it look a, effortless. Yeah. yeah it's the swan i figure it's like the swan thing it's yes. like you know it's on the on the top surface gliding gliding i don't know these say <laughs> you know just uh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I think, what was it ewan mcgregor i think said that once about being beautiful is that it you make it look effortless and then it's like yeah. nope you're you're constantly working at it now you uh, know you mentioned that how david keeps l- nailing it now i just want to i want a picture of his face on a hammer <laughs> it's, it's a david land a lander brand hammer oh. it nails it it nails it every time oh, it's, it's effortless yeah. um yeah make, yeah make that some lenny and squiggy merchandise yeah yeah, um, actually give us some merchandise, CBS. Mm-hmm. Come on. Got yep, some t shirts. Yep. Do some more. Yeah. You can actually, kids, by the way, buy your buy your dogs an official licensed t shirt with Squiggy's face on it. You this can is do a this. There's a thing. This oh, is... they got CBS has a cafe press um official cafe press store. 
that's with right, the merch designs of it. Yeah, and that's one of them. Oh yeah. man. You ever want to do that to your pets? You can do that to your pets. Oh man. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh God. I just I just try to imagine Dustin wearing one of those. That oh, that'd be cute. That'd be cute. Now I'm gonna look up. Okay. Eventually. Um. So while you're looking that up, I'm gonna get back to it's, it's one of the things I wanted to get back to because I I really want to uh, talk about her is um Julie Payne as Charmaine. Yes. Um, she's so good in yes. this episode. Um, the amazing thing is, I mean, she's great in this episode. Uh, she does return in the weird uh, the as Colonel Turner in epi- in the couple of seasons away from yeah. now, and. This is awesome little bits of trivia. So, of course, you know, like a lot of alums from Laverne and Shirley, she does show up in Spinal Tap. She's the mime waitress um, and did some other stuff, you know, through the 80s and 90s. So, like, uh, uh, family ties and, you know, she's she's just, you know, bit parts and things like that. However, she was the announcer voice in THX 1138, which is which is amazing. And she also went on to voice. Let me look this up. From 1988 to 1994 was the Dr. Liz Wilson character on Garfield and Friends and has maintained playing that part to the point that she even played it in a reboot of the series from 09 to 2013. That is so cool. I didn't know she was Liz. I did not know that. That is amazing. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was that one time that Dr. Liz Wilson um, pulled a switchblade on Laverne and Shirley. That's going to confuse a lot of small kids. <laughs> yeah. And hey, she's also a fellow Oregonian. So cool. Good. Way to go, Julie. Awesome. That is cool. God, her name uh, is familiar. I'm going to be like mortified if it turns out I've actually met this person and I didn't recognize them. No way. I mean, it's it's yeah, unlikely. I love that. But... I love that. We didn't get to the second part of what the boys did. Um, yes. They so that's the thing. Up- so we- yeah, well, sorry, brother. No, you got it. Well, I was going to say is, yeah, okay, yeah, just to ref- refresh. So they get the money. They're in the money. So what are they going to do with that money? They're going to spend it on girls like they always do. <laughs> yeah. Girls will spend, spend time with them and pay attention to them, but girls are the hottest. Oh, and so boy. they show up at the Diamond Dance place in costume. Yeah. As a big game hunter, which is Lenny. And the novelist, which is Squiggy. And yeah. they pose as these big fancy guys to, in their minds, uh, give these girls a, something to look forward to. Right. Because they tip big, apparently. Right. Hickey and, and sticky. My goodness. Hickey and sticky. <laughs> that's, that, I mean, of, course, of course they would come up with a nickname like that, though. That's, yeah. that's, or yeah. a pseudonym, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. And and yeah. and just like I I my, my notice, are you kidding me? The novelist and the big game hunter. Uh, and I love and I love that that Squiggy's book is Famous Monsters of Japan, which yeah. I, I I need to look this up. I forgot to look this up. Um, if the Famous Monsters magazine was around at the time, no, it was not. It did not. Oh. No, wait. I take that back. Started in 1958 by James hey. Warren and Forrest Ackerman. Okay, it's just on the cusp. It's just on the cusp. Cool. So. That's cool. That's fun. That's, That's so cute. much fun. Um, yeah. There is nothing better in the universe than the way Cindy Williams delivers the line novelist. It's total resentment or glaring as mm-hmm. Squiggy. And, I actually, yeah, yeah, I have a little emoji of the frowny face next to next to my note of her saying yeah. that. Novelist. Novelist. Never. That is just the best delivery ever. And of course, the boys, you know, after noting how swollen Shirley's chest is now, and after realizing, you know, they have to keep each other's secrets now, they pull out the tickets and go, yep. let's dance. And I love the difference between the way the girls deal mm-hmm. with dancing with the boys. Mm-hmm. Laverne seems like generally amused by Lenny. Generally, like, you know, letting him do his thing, letting him drag her around a little. And Shoy's just like annoyed as hell with Squiggy as he steps on her dress and bumps mm-hmm. into her and ruins the moment. And that's just that's just the character's dynamics in a lot of ways. This oh, is yeah. the dynamic. That's just the four way dynamic between the two the four of them. It is. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, I like that. Like, yeah, my my notes is, is you know, oh my god, Squiggy, just no, no, Squiggy. <laughs> <laughs> and at least at least Lenny's trying to like do something, you yeah. know? Um Yeah, it's it's cute. That's I mean, I have to say that's one of uh, probably the highlight of the whole dance hall sequence is the boys yeah. showing up. And I love the realization moment. I, I tried to, you know, f- type this yeah. out as but the the hello, you know, that that <laughs> it's so Oh God! And that that horrifying line—it makes me laugh, but it's so gross. Is uh, ah, fresh fish in the flesh pond. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I love alliteration to begin with, but you add a little bit of you know risque gross grossness to it, and man, I'm there. You know, I I might hate it, but I'll it'll be right. there. Right there in the flesh pond. <laughs> and we can't uh, we can't forget that we have to pour one out, press F to pray respects to shot to those two books of the book, two pages of the book that got shot off by Lenny, by uh, Lenny. We don't know which one is Hickey or Sticky. Do no, we? we don't. They don't, they don't specify. They don't specify who's Hickey and who's Sticky. <laughs> I just love they actually concerned with the nicknames. And they, nobody, nobody asks questions. Nobody asks questions is the best part. Nobody asks questions about why these guys would have these nicknames, and it's great. Yeah, uh, or the... Um, the amazing thing and, and the amazing thing, I love their cosplay. The whole costume play of it yes. is very it's very them too. It's like yes. these these kids getting to play pretend. They really I love that they've leaned so hard into the costume aspect with yes. the boys. Yes. That becomes more and more and more of a thing as the show goes on. Uh they'll, they'll nice. come in in a funny costume, going off to do something, and they annoy the girls for two seconds and as Michael called them, the Amel No, that's actually from David. David called them this. The Amel Nitrate twins. You pop, us for two sec- you pop us for two seconds and you laugh. This is what I thought it was. Yeah. 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 And, uh, God, I, of course, you know, we have to mention though, by the way, as we're getting, you know, rounding around to the, towards the end of the episode, yes. of course, Carmine ratted them out. What a skunk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can see why he did that for for their own good in a way, being Mr. Protective. Because he is protective of the girls. But he could have also get, gotten the better jobs. And, and that's the thing I was going to say. He could have had them either at the dance studio. Yeah. He does so many other things that doesn't involve this. And they pointed out um, that his record changer ran off to somebody. Yeah. They so they could have easily done it if they had to. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Could have easily gotten the better job. But he didn't. So that's like. So yeah. he so he goes ahead and involves Frank, and then we yeah, go to the yeah. pizza bowl at the end of the episode, and uh, Shirley is throwing clear goo goo eyes at Carmine after everything with the Lucille situation has already right. played out, which makes no sense so far do, in this part. Do, of camp. do you want me to do you want me to say my notes about Shirley and Carmine for that <laughs> singing the song? Depends on if you want to keep it in or you want to edit it later. Let me put it that way. <laughs> No, well, gonna... let me just put it this way. For those of you that have seen the episode, it's going to be hard to argue that Shirley's still thirsty for that salami and Carmine reportedly still craving that cannoli. Oh, God. <laughs> I like that I said that casually enough that I'm, I'm oh. curious how many people are going to catch that. It might take them a oh, second. God. I hope so. It's probably not going to make it off the cutting room floor. <laughs> but I, I still, but yeah. Anyway, but back on track. I, uh, I love track. also even just like there's a lot of little details in this episode that kind of get fleshed out nicely at the end. I actually really felt the the kind of the the tag scene I felt was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I love the slang around the pizza joint, you know, put wheels yeah. on it. Um, yeah. And the little bit of payback. At, at, the payback of Rosie was maybe a little superfluous, but it was cute. It was a good, you know, spaghetti to the face joke, you know? Yeah. And Rosie's frankly earned it. You know, treating them the way they True. did. So a little spaghetti yeah. to the face won't hurt her. And ultimately, it's the perfect way to uh, blow off the whole situation with her not helping them. Mm-hmm. So in, the end, in the end, that works very well. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Fun little episode. Fun little episode. Fun little episode. This is good. Yeah, it's um again, it's like kind of like the guinea pigs episode. If you're in the mood for the physical comedy, this is a very this is a very good one. Especially if you if goofy dancing, this has got it in spades. I mean, the ragdoll moment oh, yeah. when they're dancing with the Italians is just phenomenal. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah, and, Ju- and Julie Payne is practically reason enough to watch this episode for I think for some people to be honest. Yeah, she's great. Her her di- her delivery is great. The dialogue is great. It's 
it's really good from her. Yep. Just the way she handles this really, really tough character mm -hmm. is out of the park fantastic. The way she just goes for it. It's really good. Yeah. So what, what, are you, what are you going to rank this one? This one is about a seven. Just for that like scene alone where the girls have to uh, dance to Hernando's hideaway with those two guys, including the guy who used to play Eric. We played mm -hmm. Eric once. It is a really fabulous little bit of physical comedy. Um, there's a lot of really fabulous stuff. Uh, because of the janky syndication edit, I feel like almost feel like I can't write it fairly. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot here that's worthwhile to see, even with the kind of edit that's on the DVD. How about you? Yeah. I think really about the same. Yeah. I think I, I would have to say the same ranking. It's um, the stuff I like about it works really well. Um, yeah. The character characters are written really well. As you were saying, the delivery is killer. Um, that's definitely a case of in a show like this, especially with some, because I noticed with Meyerson, when he does an episode, the delivery and the, I think it's like he has a tendency to listen really well to his actors to get these really good refined pieces. He gives them the nudge that they need. And you know keeps him on track, and um, yeah, this is this is a, a really hysterical episode at, at times. I mean, this this got some good laughs out of me. Um, it's it's you know it's it's I guess was the thing also I find interesting, and I, I think it's kind of a points for it, even though it's sometimes a little bit of a neutral thing for me. Is as mentioned is the the fact that it deals with something that feels a little darker, you know, a little more serious, um, yes. dangerous is. Yeah. It's it's different, so it's a little like it's kind of cool that they were unafraid to you know do those changes. And some of it's sometimes just is oblivious. You're just cranking out ideas, and you just go for it. So, you know. Anyway, but yeah, I I really enjoyed it. It was good. There's some really good supporting stuff. Um, yeah, the the girls and the boys get both great moments. Um, Edna and Frank are both you know small parts, but very pivotally yeah. fun. Um, you know, that was the man with the perfect posture. Um, yeah, it's it's good. It's solid. And and it also, you know, it it feels it makes the world feel a little fleshed out in a goofy sort of way cuz the dance hall stuff is is absurd yeah. as hell and and it's a blast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah ultimately it's a good balance to goofy and a little bit of heartfelt, just a little tight pinch of heartfelt that makes yeah. the uh, that makes the series revolve. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I guess if that's uh, everything for today, thank you so much again for joining us for Night After Night. And if you guys would like to get in touch and stay on track and watch other episodes of ours, you can find us at Night After Night Pod on Facebook and Tumblr, as well as on the, through uh, the Patreon and the YouTubes. And uh, if you're looking to be a little more direct and join us for some of the watch-alongs as we're going through the show, uh, that's done once... We're trying to get to keep that up with that once a week, but it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of something we do with the other folks in the community, but that yeah. is on on our Twitter at night f night pc, and uh, yeah, that's gonna be a that's gonna be a good time, and you know, hopefully uh, you'll join us again for the next one. Which uh, oh boy, if you like physical comedy, I think uh, oh, yeah. I think the next one has it in spades. This was named one of the best episodes of the series. It's probably one of the best ball episodes of the series. I call mm -hmm. it one of the best ball episodes of the series. Uh, this is about the time the girls tempt. To get ready for a date, and everything conspires against them when one of their neighbor's houses catches on fire and causes all manner of havoc. It's called stepping out. All right. Well, hopefully you'll be stepping in to join us next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I promise I will keep those dumb puns to a minimum from, <laughs> from here on out. I can't promise, oh. but I, I, will give my, I will give my word, I should say. Oh, they yeah. love our puns. They love our puns. They, they better. I'm getting paid by the pun. I get, I get, you know, but anyways, yes. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs> See you next time and have yourselves a wonderful week. Have fun, y'all. Stay away from men with shoes, uh, mirrors on their shoes. Oh, and don't I dance know. in the dark or at the men's room. No, neither. And you know, and listen, one more thing. If you go near any of our regulars, tell them we said hello. <laughs>